looked at uh, a bunch of models. Last week we were looking at um, the arteries of the face, right? The superficial arteries of the face. This week we're looking at the superficial veins of the face. Except it's harder to do the superficial veins in isolation, so I'm going to be touching on the deep veins as well. Um, they're similar. Some of the principles we learned when looking at the superficial arteries apply to the veins, but there are also some differences. There's um, some clinical context in terms of where infection might go if it spreads uh, within the venous blood, within the veins. Um, and this here, right? This mash of veins in the, in kind of the, this deep neck here gets a bit messy. So we'll untangle all of that and work out what all of these little stubby guys are. We must have put the fear of God into the new first year students because the lab is filled with students uh, being taught by a few second years. Um, as in like, yeah, it's, it's full of students, not just, anyway. Which is good, when to see students in the lab. Um, right, so what we got going on now, if we're following the venous blood, if we follow the arterial blood up from the neck into the face, we're going to follow the venous blood the other way, out of the face and down into the neck. Now, um, the facial vein, as you can see on here, we've only got the arteries. You can see we've got the arteries and the veins, so it looks a bit complicated, but it's all there. Um, the main one then is the facial vein which is running with the facial artery that we saw last time. Now the facial vein is it's just running posteriorly to the artery. So it's kind of it's starting up here. Um, and up here we've got a couple of branches. So, so the branch up here is going to be the angular vein and the branch here is going to be the lateral nasal vein. You might see it called the external nasal vein. Those two come together and then they form the facial vein which runs across the face, so it's going to run down here, you know, a little bit posterior to the, the corner of the mouth here, and then it's going to get down and run around the mandible around here, which is what it's doing doing there. It's 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 a little less wiggly than the artery um, for some reason, maybe because veins are a bit stretchier. You know, if I was designing, it, I might put a bit of wiggle in it, but then a bit of wiggle, you get a bit of turbulent flow. That's not good either. You know, it's trade-offs, isn't it? Um, so there's the, there's the facial vein coming in here, and you can see that there are a number of smaller veins draining the superficial face, as you might expect. Um, the veins of the face, like the arteries, there are loads of anastomoses. Veins, as elsewhere in the body, tend to be a little bit more variable in the face, but the facial vein is fairly reliable. Now it, it, runs, under the, it runs around the mandible and goes under here. Um, and it's running posterior to the artery still there. And down here, it's essentially going to drain into the internal jugular vein. Uh, you know, the main vein draining the head and neck. Bunk. Here's the other side. This great big vessel here is the internal jugular vein. The reason it's such a big vessel is because it's also draining all of the blood from inside the cranial cavity. That's dropping out through the skull, through the internal jugular vein, and running down the neck to get back to the great vessels of the thorax. So there's the facial vein here then, and it's running back to the internal jugular vein. But you can see that there are lots of other little branches around here as well that seem to be getting involved. It's a lot more complicated than the arteries, which are quite a bit more straightforward. So, we've got a couple of other venous structures to consider. First of all then, the internal jugular vein. If there's an internal jugular vein, that means there is going to be an external jugular vein. The internal jugular vein is here. The internal jugular vein is the big one, it's the deep one, hence internal, and it drops out of all those gyral venous sinuses. We've talked about this before, and goes through the jugular foramen, the big ugly hole here, and drops out of the skull, right? Uh, and that is what we are seeing here. Now, the internal jugular vein then is draining all that blood from the brain, all that blood from inside the cranium, down the neck, and here it's gonna join with the 
uh, subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein and the two brachiocephalic veins are going to come together and join to form the superior vena cava and drain to the heart, right? <laughs> Loads of blood, really quick, really easy. Now look, that, that there, and that there, those are the bits of the external jugular vein. The reason you can't see the external jugular vein is because it's very superficial. We've taken all the superficial stuff off so that we can see the deep stuff, right? Because that's how anatomy works. You cut things up. Those aren't the first years screaming, by the way. That's the crash behind the anatomy lab. The external jugular... Oh, is that it there? I can feel it. The external jugular vein is a very superficial vein. It's running in the skin. So when we dissect take the skin away, we take away the external jugular vein. And the external jugular vein, when somebody starts talking a lot and moving the face, muscles in their face and really starts getting animated, and maybe even talking really loudly, the external jugular vein starts to stand proudly in the skin of the neck. Now, I can't see if you can see it because because I can't see me neck and my monitor is over there and... But can you, you can, can is it there? Probably. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll play that back and check. So the external jugular vein then is much smaller, but it appears when you start moving the muscles of your face quite a lot. Hmm, does that mean then that it's draining blood from the muscles of the face, from the superficial face and stuff? Yeah, probably. All right, so how does the external jugular vein form? Well, we're still in this mess here. The ear is here, so that's where we have the oracle. And posterior to the oracle, we have the posterior auricular vein, draining blood from around here. Anterior to the oracle, we have the superficial temporal vein. We saw the superficial temporal artery, didn't we? Um, and we can see a little nub in here. We've also got the maxillary vein matching-ish the maxillary artery and draining blood from the deep face. So there's a few structures. Here's the superficial temporal vein draining blood down here. And it has the posterior parietal branch and the anterior frontal branch, just like we saw in the arteries, coming together to form the superficial temporal vein that descends down here and meets with the maxillary vein. Um, and when the superficial temporal vein meets the maxillary vein, they form a new vein, and that vein is the retromandibular vein. There is not a matching artery for that as such. Retromandibular, retro means like the 1980s, right? Maybe not. Retromandibular. So it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, post It's kind of going around the... Ma anyway, the retromandibular vein is going through the parotid gland and then popping out down here. So if we add all that up, we have the superficial temporal vein meeting with the maxillary vein to form the retromandibular vein that is going to run through the parotid gland and kind of around the mandible here to get down there, and here's the posterior auricular vein. Now, when the posterior auricular vein meets with the retromandibular vein, that's when we form the external jugular vein, which then runs down the neck very superficially and over the top of sternocleidomastoid to drain directly into the subclavian vein down here. Got it? I'm sure a few labelled modelly thingies might help clarify that. The problem is, of course, um, again, we've got cut off bits around here, little stumps of veins, you have to work out what's going on. And then we've got a more complete model here, but you can't see everything because it's a more complete model. You may have to take things off, but, but that's the crux of it. Now, to add on to that, um, deep within the face here, kind of in the infratemporal fossa there, there is a, a pterygoid plexus of veins. The pterygoid relates to the wing shape of the bones in there. But the pterygoid venous plexus is a venous plexus in the deep face that's draining blood from deep face structures. So let's add all that up. All right, so we've got the superficial temporal vein draining blood from up here. It meets with the maxillary vein, which is draining blood from the, the deeper structures. And when those two meet anterior to the oracle, they form the 
uh, retromandibular vein which runs through the parotid gland uh, kind of around the mandible posteriorly and pops out down here. Here's the posterior auricular vein. Now the retromandibular vein when it joins with the posterior auricular vein which is kind of what's happening here that's when you form the external jugular vein which then runs down the neck very superficially, superficial to uh, sternocleidomastoid here and drains into the subclavian vein, right? Um, the retromandibular vein though doesn't just do that. The reason we have this complicated network here is the retromandibular vein also drains blood to the facial vein. Here's the facial vein wiggling around here. So the retromandibular vein is draining to the facial vein, which is then draining to the internal jugular vein. So the internal and external jugular veins, the facial vein, the retromandibular vein, all these things are joined up which is why this looks so complicated. So you've got to learn all the veins in isolation and then join them up here, and then it starts to make a bit of sense. So the pterygoid venous plexus is draining blood from structures of the deep face through the maxillary vein and through all those other veins that we've been talking about. And there is a deep facial vein draining blood from structures of the deep face back to the pterygoid venous plexus. All right, there are a few other undefined veins across the, the face here, but that's veins for you, isn't it? That's what they do. When, all right, here's the important stuff. When we looked at the arteries of the face, we saw these guys up here, and they have matching venous bits, right? Essentially what we're seeing here are supratrochlear and supraorbital veins. And those supratrochlear and supraorbital veins are going to drain to the veins of the orbit. You can see they're anastomosing with other things around here, and that's all fine and lovely. But in the eye, the ophthalmic vein is draining blood from the orbit. And that then drains, well, the blood can actually pass two ways the deep face, goes on to terrible venous plexus and stuff. But more interestingly, the ophthalmic vein drains blood from the orbit back through the superior orbital fissure into the cranial cavity. So that means that veins from up here can drain blood from the face back through the ophthalmic vein and back into the cranial cavity. And what we've got in here, so we talked about the um, the internal carotid artery sitting around here. Now, the, around this region here, we have the uh, cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus really is another plexus of veins around here. It's part of the dural venous sinus system. And the blood from the orbit and the blood from the face here is draining black to the cavernous sinus. That's all fine and interesting, but why is that important? Well, the face is quite an exposed thing, isn't it? Um, and the face has what we call, it gets called a danger triangle and it gets called a danger space. And the danger triangle runs like, we push there, top of the nose, da, 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 da. and the danger space is kind of, probably anatomically is a bit more appropriate, kind of from the corner of the mouth, across here, forehead, down, right? So this here is like the danger area. Why? Well, if you have an infection in the skin of the face, which is fairly common if you have acne, zits, spots, and you pick your spots and they get infected. Normally they don't get infected, right? Because you keep your face nice and clean. But then if you've got spots, is that because you didn't keep your face nice and clean? Or is that just because you're um, a, a spotty teenager with overactive sebaceous glands and what have you? Anyway, wash your face with soap. In this region then, it's possible that if the skin around here gets infected, that that infection, those bacteria, the pus and what have you, could pass into these superficial veins of the face. It's no great leap that, right? Now, much of the flow of blood is down the face and into the neck, as we've already described. But some of the blood will flow with these veins into the orbit, through the ophthalmic vein, check the spelling, and into the cranial cavity. And of course, once it's in the cranial cavity, well, then you have risk of an abscess in there, you have risk of infection of, you know, of the brain, of the meninges, and that sort of thing. All of those things are bad news. Little infection on the face is, is not a big deal, but infection in here is a bad thing. So that's why the venous drainage 
is important, venous drainage of the face, and that's why this gets called the danger space or the danger triangle. Okay. A similar thing can happen in the scalp um, because there are some small emissary veins linking some of the layers of the scalp to the blood vessels inside the cranial cavity. So it's not just an infection to the, the face here, but also the scalp up here. There's a risk of infection passing through those small foramina uh, in the in the skull um, and into the cranial cavity. Right? It is rare, you know, um, it's not terribly likely because um, an infection on your face is a pretty obvious thing and you're going to take care of it and you're going to keep the skin clean, but it is a possibility. Also, of course, if you're injecting anaesthetic around here, ooh, there's a risk of it also going with the venous blood. All right, but there you go. There's the the superficial veins of the face and that complicated network around here of the retromandibular vein and the external and internal jugular veins and the facial veins and, and that sort of thing, all right? So there we go, we're done. Um, next week, maybe I'll go into the deep face or maybe we'll take a break and go somewhere else in the body and come back to the deep face in another week. I'll stick it on my list though. All right, see you uh, next week.